Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, we revisit Alison Katz of Independent Who with some outtakes from last week's brilliant interview on the unholy alliance between the World Health Organization and the pro-nuclear independent atomic energy agency. Then we have a special encore presentation to our extended interview with Joseph Mangano of Radiation and Public Health, who breaks the code on exactly how the WHO manipulates its nuclear statistics. Eye-opening and jaw-dropping information coming up shortly. Today is Tuesday, June 3rd, 2014. And this week, we continue our focus on the World Health Organization, its alliance with the IAEA, and how it has manipulated information about Chernobyl and Fukushima to create the impression that there has not been, nor will there ever be, any significant, their word, health impact from the radiation releases of those two nuclear disasters. We're going to start with information that has not been on nuclear hot seat before. These are outtakes from the interview with Alison Katz of Independent WHO. The information she gave was so rich and so full that we simply did not have room for all of it on the one-hour podcast. Last week's encore presentation of our interview with her blasted wide open any illusion anyone might have had that the World Health Organization is actually looking after the world's health when it comes to exposure to nuclear radiation. Here from the original interview is her information on background politics within the United Nations, the impact of the independent WHO demonstration outside of WHO headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, and a major flaw in their statistical analyses after Chernobyl. This last piece will provide a perfect springboard into the segments with Joseph Mangano. First, Alison Katz gives a comprehensive overview of the geopolitics of the WHO, how it functions, who's actually in charge, and how it has been used to manipulate our understanding of nuclear technology on our world. I think if it's interesting, we we should just have have a little look at the geopolitics of the World Health Organization and the UN and how they function, because I'm not sure that the general public really understands that. In principle, WHO is run by its member states. They make up the governing bodies. But in reality and in practice, as everywhere in the world, it isn't all member states. They are not all equal. And in the area of uh, nuclear power, three, it is the big three. It is the United States, it is the United Kingdom, and it is France. If you like, you could uh, enlarge that to the G8. But basically, who determines policies in this area, USA, UK, and France? Now, the World Health Assembly is the place where decisions are made. It's the, the, the biggest big meeting once a year with all the member states. It ought to be democratic, but of course it is not. And I would say that decisions are made in the corridors of power. And there's, in addition to that, but there is bargaining going on in all kinds of different fora. I'll just give you one example. There is only one international organization that actually has any real power, and that is the World Trade Organization. So just to explain how little power the World Health Assembly has. A country can easily be persuaded to vote a certain way at the World Health Assembly in exchange for important concessions at the World Trade Organization. That kind of thing is terribly depressing because what it really means is that an organization like the World Health Organization, which may be very important to the public, but it simply isn't important to governments who are only interested in economic affairs, it would seem. Um, And so... This is how we understand that at the World Health Assembly, public health can be sacrificed, if you like, for economic interests that are being negotiated in quite another fora. It it, is quite complex, but I think it's important that everybody understands that. Uh, There's another point that I think we should understand, that in terms of undue influence, we've seen that there are powerful governments, but there's also the private sector. And today, WHO is heavily 
some people would say WHO is overwhelmingly directed by private interests. And of course, the powerful member states are promoting the interests of their transnational corporations through the World Health Organization at the World Health Assembly. And that, again, is a dreadful reflection of the fact that governments themselves, national governments themselves, are so influenced by the private sector. One, one additional very worrying trend is that um, another major conduit for influence by the private sector is millionaire, I call it millionaire philanthropy. Of course, the most well-known of these is the Bill, and Gillen, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which today carries undue weight in WHO. Um, in fact, he is the foundation is giving more money to WHO than any other member state, including his own. Uh, I think that is the case today. So what we have at the United Nations is plutocracy rather than democracy. In other words, it is money that is ruling. But it, it is only the reflection of plutocracy in our own national governments. With more than seven years of five-day-a-week, 52-weeks-a-year protests at WHO headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, one might expect a reaction from employees who have to walk past it every workday. According to Alison Katz, the answer is both no and yes. Getting back to the protests that you have been doing for seven years now, how do the employees of WHO react, and what, if any, impact have you had upon them? Yes, I have to say that the employees of WHO, they're, they're, they're a fairly apolitical group who, like, who simply, I, I, I hate to be dismissive, but mostly just in, in, enjoy a very nice situation and are not, are, are, do not want to get involved in anything that resolves, resembles a demonstration or a protest. So at the beginning, I think that what we were seen as was, you know, a nice bunch of people, naive eccentrics as environmental activists are always seen, you know, until some absolutely dreadful catastrophe happens. So when Fukushima happened, I have to say that there was, there was a significant change. And there are very many signs of sympathy and interest since Fukushima. There, there were a few before Fukushima, but since Fukushima, I would say that the employees of WHO and also many visitors not only give us you know, the thumbs up sign of encouragement. Uh, quite a lot have come to visit us to talk about the action. And um, I think that they now probably are saying to themselves, well, they're not just a bunch of eccentrics. They've really got something there and I need to look at it carefully. That's, of course, what we are hoping. I then asked her what kind of impact the independent WHO demonstration is actually having. In terms of impact, it's always extremely difficult to know what kind of impact you're having. You don't expect an overnight transformation. We all know these are very long-term struggles, and let's remember that we are facing the world's most powerful lobby. But I'd say that the issue of WHO shows independence, lack of independence, sorry, is becoming known. We are an embarrassment. There are all kinds of visitors to WHO, including, of course, all the ministers of health, scientists, public health officials, and so on, and say they see these big signs when they enter WHO. And, of course, I don't doubt that many of them do ask the people they come to see at WHO, well, who are those people? Have you met with them? What are you doing about it? Um, WHO is certainly discredited today to some extent in this area, despite as we were saying, the fact that it does carry considerable prestige. I think in the area of radiation and health, it is somewhat discredited. More and more people are skeptical of its claims of 50 or so deaths from Chernobyl and so on. And with Fukushima, that skepticism is growing very, very fast. The public seems to understand that the whole truth has not been told. Then Allison elaborated on one of the major flaws with the way the WHO compiled its statistics on Chernobyl radiation exposures and the impact that they had upon the world's health. Just to go back to a second major flaw is to average exposures over territories and populations. And this is as absurd as taking an average temperature of all patients in a hospital. It means nothing because fallout is uneven. It's patchy. 
the only accurate way to calculate is through a whole body measurement in an individual. And that is studiously not done, except by independent institutes. Um, as I say, children are many times more vulnerable and fetuses a hundred times more. In addition, people who live a hundred meters apart can have suffered incredibly different exposures. There's another way in which they average, and this is another major flaw. They fail to take into account different effects inside the body in different organs. And this is critical. You cannot just average out radio contamination over the body as if it was a sort of bag of water. And, of course, this is physicists' mechanistic calculation. It is not the way a molecular biologist would look at the problem. And here's another useful metaphor. It's like the bullet in a football crowd. You can claim that if you divide up the force of the bullet across the entire population of a football stadium, of course the bullet fired into a stadium wouldn't have any impact whatsoever, but that is not what happens. The bullet lodges in one of the people at the stadium and kills that person. And it would be just as absurd if you tried to average out the impact of the bullet in one body. If it lodges in the heart, the liver may be intact. In other words, if you just use common sense, and this is where I think the public can very easily grasp the pseudoscience that we are being fed by the nuclear establishment. One last thing is that there is no mention of hot particles. This is incredibly important. Hot particles are ignored. So we're talking here about hot particles of radionuclides, whether, radi whether these be plutonium, cesium, strontium, all of these are highly dangerous, any of the uranium isotopes. One particle lodged in the lung, it will irradiate for life and it will lead to a cancer. This is what we are seeing with depleted uranium in Iraq, Afghanistan, Palestine, and of course in the former Yugoslavia. Another omission is that no account is taken of the interaction of chemical and radioactive contamination. At Chernobyl, for example, an enormous quantity, huge tons and tons of lead were poured over the burning reactor in order to put out the fire. And so there is, a contaminate, there is lead contamination in the area as well as radio contamination. And uh, the interaction between the two obviously is, is absolutely dreadful. But no account is taken of that. That was Alison Katz of Independent WHO with additional information, the outtakes, from our interview of last week on the unholy alliance between the World Health Organization and the pro-nuclear International Atomic Energy Agency. We'll move on to our featured interview this week with Joseph Mangano, but first, I want to remind you that Nuclear Hot Seat needs your donations to keep bringing you the anti-nuclear information you've come to rely upon. We have monthly bandwidth charges, hosting charges, and the cost of increasing security on the website, so we are never again hacked, no matter how much the pro-nuclear forces would like this to happen. So whatever you can do to assist us in keeping this program going is appreciated. You can donate by going to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down and click on the big red Donate button. It will put you through to PayPal, and everything is secure. Whatever you can do to help, thank you. Arigato. Gracias. Merci. Grazie. Toda raba. And all the other languages I've neglected to mention. Next is the special Encore presentation I promised of my interview with Joseph Mangano, an epidemiologist and executive director of the Radiation and Public Health Project Research Group, Radiation.org. You know they've been around a long time because it's a single word with a dot .org and those just don't exist anymore. Joe and I spoke at length about the late Dr. Rosalie Bertel's analysis of the IAEA's epidemiological straitjacket on the World Health Organization. Joe tells us exactly what information they have been prevented from sending out into the public. And when I say it was a jaw-dropper to hear the restrictions that gag the WHO when it comes to nuclear health dangers, it is not an exaggeration. Joe explains exactly why these rules are ludicrous and how they disallow making public any information that risks making nuclear look and sound exactly as dangerous as it really is. Joe, we're putting the spotlight on the relationship between the World Health Organization and the International Atomic Energy Agency. 
and how the pro-nuclear IAEA has taken control of what the WHO can say about anything having to do with radiation. Specifically, we're focusing on how in the world the WHO can justify releasing a report earlier this year. It was right around the second anniversary of Fukushima. This report downplays the health impact of ongoing radiation release from the triple meltdown nuclear disaster. It uses the word slight all the time, puts it down, and tries to make it sound like the worst thing that you can face after a nuclear disaster is your own emotional response to it. First of all, just a general overview. From an epidemiological perspective, how accurate is this WHO report? The WHO report is completely inaccurate because just just from what you said, Libby, it violates the basic principle of scientific research, and that is to objectively come up with a hypothesis or thesis and to base it on something such as radiation is harmful and lots of radiation was released uh, from Fukushima, and then to examine the data and to see whether it supports or doesn't support the, the hypothesis. Simple as that. This is just the latest in a very, very long, decades-long tragedy where many esteemed scientists in places like the IAEA and the WHO have simply assumed that certain levels of radiation just cannot harm humans and that it's just been proven wrong by many, many, many studies from the beginning. What should have been done was to say, well, we have to do these studies to know how, how harmful is radiation at various doses. And that's never been done and still it continues to go on. It's, it's been politicized is, is the way I can sum that up. And that's, that's a terrible thing because people are suffering and have suffered. And is the politics what is behind this assumption that is taking place by the scientists, do you think? Well, you, you can't talk about nuclear power, whether it's Fukushima or Chernobyl or Three Mile Island or just running nuclear plants routinely without first understanding where nuclear power came from. Nuclear power, in other words, operating reactors to generate electricity, was an outgrowth of the initial use of nuclear power, and that was for military purposes, the atomic bomb. All right, we all know that's the Manhattan Project and, and the use of the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then quickly the, the Cold War um, competition between the U.S. and the Soviets to test and, and build a, a large arsenal of nuclear weapons. As this was going on, and as people got more and more concerned and really frightened about what this great but frightening new technology could do, officials scrambled to remind us that you could use the atom for other purposes, you know, the peaceful atom, one of the, which would be to generate electricity. And while that's certainly true, and uh, a lot of electricity has been produced through nuclear reactors, the proponents of this never owned up to the health hazards, which I say fall into three categories. Number one, how can you assure us that a catastrophic meltdown won't happen? Number two, how can you assure us that the waste that routinely is emitted from reactors don't harm people? And number three, what do you do with most of the waste that we have to keep safe and secure for many thousands of years? They didn't have any answers then. They don't have any answers now. And we're stuck with the technology. And we are st very much entrenched with this technology. So when you say nuclear power, think of it as just a, uh, an atomic bomb used to make electricity because it is the exact same process and produces the exact same chemicals as the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. Joe, in looking deeper into the health aspect of this issue, I discovered a 1999 article by Dr. Rosalie Bertel that was published in The Ecologist. And what she did in it was run down the IAEA's criteria as to what qualifies as a radiation-causing illness statistic. I found it pretty outrageous. And what I'd like to do is go over these points and get your specific input so people can understand exactly how, at the source, we have been steered away from the truth. The first one she listed is, if a radiation-causing cancer is not fatal, the IAEA will not count it. Absolutely, totally irresponsible, especially as time goes on, because some cancers 
are becoming quite treatable, and especially radiation-sensitive cancers like thyroid cancer. It's the fastest-growing cancer in the, in the developed world, and it is highly linked with exposure to radiation, especially radioactive iodine. So most people with thyroid cancer are diagnosed and treated, and they live. So there's, there's few deaths, but to say that because there's few deaths, it's not radiosensitive is absolutely wrong. Uh, child cancer is the same thing. Physicians are doing much better in keeping children stricken with cancer alive. However, that does not mean that radiation isn't quite possibly playing a, a role in rising child cancer rates. And, of course, these child cancer rates are growing exponentially in Japan, Absolutely. in the Fukushima area. They're already starting to find full-blown thyroid cancer yep. just two years after the disaster began. Yeah, unfortunately, the children are the canary birds of humanity when it comes to radiation because they're the ones in which you would see the most immediate effects of, of an exposure, such as, such as Fukushima and such as Chernobyl. The second one that Dr. Bertel listed, I think you've kind of covered this, is if a cancer is initiated by another carcinogen but accelerated or promoted by exposure to radiation, it is not counted. I'll cite somebody much more prominent and famous than me in this, and that is Rachel Carson, who, of course, was the author of the seminal 1962 book, Silent Spring. Ooh, book that changed my life. The, the book that changed your life and a lot of people's lives. I mean, it really got into President Kennedy's desk and got him thinking about things like atomic bomb testing and so on. The book mostly was about DDT and, and pesticides. However, later in the book, Carson goes on to say that strontium-90 and, and other radioactive chemicals are the sinister partner of DDT and pesticides. And she uses the word synergy, which means you're putting two types of poison together. And when you put two types of poisons together, the outcome in terms of harm to humans is far greater than one plus one. You know, we, we know this, like, for example, if you smoke, you're at risk for lung cancer. If you work in a coal mine, you're at risk for lung cancer. But if you're a coal miner who smokes, you're at very, very, very high risk for lung cancer. So, yeah, to, to ignore any other of the many poisons in, in our environment is absolutely irresponsible. Here's another good one from the IAEA. If an autoimmune disease or any non-cancer is caused by radiation, it is not counted. <laughs> Why? Um, you know, it's... Um, <laughs> because they're the IAEA and they yeah, can say so. Right, right. It may, again, um, my why was a rhetorical question. It makes no sense from a biochemical standpoint because radiation harms not just the thyroid gland or, or harms kids, but it harms the entire immune system, which means it goes beyond just thyroid cancer or just cancer. For example, one of the more famous chemicals in, in the mix that reactors put out is strontium, several types of strontium, strontium-89, strontium-90. Strontium is like calcium. The, the body thinks it's calcium. So when you drink it, say in milk or water, it goes quickly into your stomach, and it quickly attaches to bone and teeth and starts killing and, and impairing cells. And it also doesn't stop at the bone. It can penetrate into the bone marrow. And in the bone marrow are the white blood cells and the red blood cells, which form the immune army, okay? These are the cells that we count on to fight any disease, all right, not just cancer. So to say just thyroid cancer is sensitive to radiation or, uh, or other cancer is, is, is wrong. It's any immune disease, things like pneumonia, things like uh, allergies, things like the common cold. I mean, they're not quite as dramatic as uh, certain types of cancer, but... Might lupus be in that mix as well? Sure. It's an autoimmune system disease. It relies on the immune system to fight, and the immune system is kind of doing it backwards, as you know. It's fighting it too hard. Any impairment of the white and the red blood cells is going to do multiple types of damage. Again, I'm, I'm dropping names here, so it's not just my opinion. John Goffman, a famous physicist and, and physician, who worked on the Manhattan Project, discovered uranium-233, all, all this stuff. Later in his life, he was very strong about radiation's harm to the heart. You know, we, we think cancer first. We think, you know, birth defects first. But no, no, the, the heart, which, again, is, is something that the immune system relies on. And there's a book out about Chernobyl by a, a man named Alexei Yablokov, Y-A-B-L-O-K-O-V. came out in 2009. I've interviewed him for Nuclear Hot oh, good, good, good. Yeah, he and his partners go into 
what happened after Chernobyl. Not just the thyroid gland or not just cancer, but literally diseases of every basic organ system of, of the human body, respiratory and digestive and endocrine and on and on and on, all, all elevated rates after the Chernobyl disaster. So that is yet another irresponsible statement on the IAEA's part, or, or WHO, I'm sorry. Here's one that I find really upsetting because it goes so to the core of what we're most afraid of from radiation, at least many yeah. of the people I speak with. And that is that according to the IAEA, radiation damaged embryos or fetuses which result in miscarriage or stillbirth do not count. I'd, I'd like whoever wrote that to identify themselves so I could ask them if it was your child that was the victim of a, a stillbirth or, or a fetal death if the person lived near a nuclear plant or after a meltdown or something, what they would think about it, quote, not counting. Of course it counts. They, they, we know the fetus is far, far more sensitive to radiation than um, adults are. I mean, it, infants and children too, but the fetus more. After three months, think of the fetus. It's the size of a lima bean, all right? It's incredibly sensitive to lots of environmental toxins, including radiation. So to ignore the fetus is just... Um, and we see evidence of higher miscarriage levels and, and, you know, stillbirth rates during bomb testing and after Chernobyl and so on. That's, again, irresponsible and just not part of the scientific method that I mentioned at the beginning. And it's not scientific of me, but it's just heartless. It's heartless. So that brings us to the next one. And this goes to those images that we get from Chernobyl of those poor children who have been born, one of whom I've actually met. And that is that a congenitally blind, deaf, or malformed child whose illnesses are radiation-related are not included in the figures of the IAEA because, quote, this is not genetic damage, but rather is teratogenic and will not be passed on later to the child's offspring. Explain the term and explain what this means. Teratogenic really, really means it's something that, that just ha it just occurs, you know, as, as a part of our human existence without linking it to a specific cause or causes. So, in other words, it's a bad luck accident as opposed to anything that right. has a specific cause. Yeah, from the beginning of time, we've had birth defects, of course, you know, uh, long, long before uh, the, the bomb was developed or nuclear power was developed. However, we're trying to identify which ones that were caused by exposure to radiation. And again, ignoring the basic biochemistry of what radiation does, it damages cells specifically, it breaks the cell membrane, these, these, these hot particles, sort of like a wild bull in a china shop. They're unstable atoms, they break the cell membrane, they break into the cell nucleus where the DNA strands are, which is life, the code for life. In, in doing so, damage a number of things, including the sperm, including the ova. And that means if you have a damaged sperm and open, continue to live and procreate, you are passing down those damaged organs to the next generation. The body can, in fact, heal itself and self-repair their, their damaged cells to a degree. Sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. Again, having any cells deformed like this presents a risk not just to the person who has been exposed directly, but to their children and, and future generations. This was known for years. This was, Lord, a 1927 experiment with fruit flies. I think the fellow's name was Mendelev, who documented, I think he used x-rays, but how the, the DNA was, not just the fly was damaged, but uh, future generations were damaged as well. They didn't know what DNA was then, but this is not just my opinion. This is clearly documented by some of the most eminent scientists in the world. This is staggering because it's one thing as an amateur in all of this to look at the IAEA criteria as was listed here. There are more we'll go into and be appalled by it. But to hear the specific explanations from you is devastating because the science is there and it's provable, but we're not allowed to connect to it, or at least the who under the IAEA's criteria is not allowed to connect to it we should be able to count on the World Health Organization to be accountable for the world's health, and instead this is an intentional manipulation in the opposite direction. Remember, uh, as I, I said a few minutes ago, the whole issue of radiation health 
is a culture, and the culture developed not with nuclear power reactors, but their predecessor, the, the atomic bomb. When the atomic it was all military. And there was no room for failure because when the Manhattan Project took place, it was with the understanding that the Nazi Germans were building their own atomic bomb, and we had to beat them to it. So even though there, you know, no one tried to deliberately harm anyone, health took a, a very much a backseat to getting that bomb and, and using it. Then when the World War II ended, there was the Cold War and the race to build more and test more and more nuclear weapons before the Soviets could because many people in high positions, all the military and a number of the politicians believed that a nuclear war was inevitable. All right. And again, when you're under that kind of fire, health takes a secondary rate. So the, the lying and the, and the deception began then. And again, it becomes like a culture and it, and it continues even to this day, even though we don't, we haven't used any bombs on people since Hiroshima and Nagasaki and even though we don't test nuclear weapons anymore. That culture is still there that, hey, below a certain level of radiation, there's no hazard. And that's just absolutely irresponsible. You have to do the studies. Another of Dr. Bertel's points was that the IAE insists that causing the genetic predisposition to breast cancer or heart disease does not count since these are not, quote, serious genetic diseases, end quote, in the Mendelian sense. I assume that what she meant was that certain cancers are because of genetic predisposition rather than an environmental exposure like radiation. Is that, am I getting that right? This is about radiation exposure causing oh, a causing. genetic predisposition. Well, it does, <laughs> as, as I just mentioned about the attacks to the DNA and, and especially to the sperm and the ova. It's quite amazing to me that, you know, we hear a lot in the news on the breast cancer gene, the BRCA1 and 2. Interesting to me that with all the discussion about whether, you know, women should have mastectomies right away or, or to watch and wait, there's no discussion about what predisposes women to the BRCA1 and 2. How, how did they get them? You know, they're parents and grandparents have them, and, um, you know, are there other reasons? You can't discount environmental factors here. And, again, since we know radiation damages genes, damages the DNA, as they, they're not doing, but they should go down the list of possible causes, this has to be one. Radiation that never existed in our ecology until the 1940s, but now is very much a part of it, should be looked at. I look at the current cancer rates, and considering that it's been estimated it can take up to 70 years for the impact of low-level radiation to make itself known physically. We started in 1945, so we're coming up on 70 years, and now 41% of us are expected to get cancer. Expected exactly right. to get cancer. So this may just be the radiation exposure that started since 1945 coming home to roost, and we haven't seen the end of it yet. And by the way, that 41%, you're, you're absolutely right, that's the National Cancer Institute's number of those who will be diagnosed with a cancer in, in their lifetime in, in the U.S. However, there are more. There are a number of elderly men, for example, who die, and upon autopsy, they see uh, prostate tumors, prostate cancers there that men were never diagnosed with. They're relatively small, but they're there. There are others with relatively small thyroid cancers. A number of, of people on autopsy, you know, who are never diagnosed with thyroid cancer actually d die with it. So that 41% is, is actually a low number, if you can believe that. I mean, literally, cancer is for almost everybody, which is just, that should disturb every person that's hearing this and every human being in this country because it was never the case. You know, years ago, and there are other infectious diseases that were great killers, cancer was low on the list. It know. used to be a rare disease. It was a rarity, yeah. They call them tumors, and, and not that long ago, a you know, hundred years ago, but all through the 20th century and through now, it's beginning to dominate. And again, many factors can account for cancer, but you have to put radiation in as many forms as one, and you have to do the studies. You can't just make these assumptions like the ones you're reading off to me. Um, the IAEA has done such a thorough job of knocking this out. There's some more outrageous ones coming. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fasten your seatbelts. We'll have more on Joseph Mangano's devastating analysis of how the International Atomic Energy Agency prevents the World Health Organization from providing the world's population with an accurate analysis of radiation risks. But first, 
I want to remind you that Nuclear Hot Seat needs your support to keep bringing you the anti-nuclear information you won't get anywhere else. That always includes the week's anti-nuclear news, radiation protection tips, activist opportunities, numbnuts of the week for nuclear boneheadedness, the NRC Doc Report, and so much more. So if you'd like to help keep us moving and growing, go to our website, nuclearhotseat.com. On the home page, scroll down and click on the big red donate button. You really can't miss it. Whatever you can do to help, know that it's appreciated. Now, back to Joseph Mangano of Radiation and Public Health Project on how the IAEA has muzzled, dominated, and shut up any true information on radiation from the World Health Organization. This is another one from the IAEA. Even if radiation causes a fatal cancer or serious genetic disease in a live-born infant, it is discounted if the estimated radiation dose is below 100 millisieverts. Ah, there we go. There, there, there's the big one right there. That is in the war of the last half century or more about radiation and its health effects. This is the key battle. Is there, in fact, a, quote, safe dose of radiation? And from the beginning... Officials in the United States and other countries assumed that there was, right? And when nuclear power plants began to operate, they set what they called permissible limits, and so they quickly converted them to safe limits of emissions into the environment, that below that, this level that there would be no harm to human beings, even though once you release radiation from nuclear reactors, it's out there and it's going to get into us. It gets into the air. It gets into the food chain and it gets into our bodies, simple as that. Way back when, people began to doubt that assumption. Again, it's, it's, it's terrible, terrible science because you're making a huge assumption based on no studies. The first really big study to question this was done by a great physician, Dr. Alice Stewart of Oxford University in the, in the mid-1950s. She wasn't actually doing a radiation study. She actually was looking to find out reasons why British children were dying of cancer and leukemia. And she found nothing except one thing, that prenatal x-rays to the abdomen of the mother, which was done pretty commonly about to about 8 10% of women, just for diagnostic purposes to see where the, how big the baby was and where the head was and so forth. She found that that nearly doubled the chance um, a child would die of cancer by age 10. Of course, as soon as you publish the article, all hell breaks loose. You know, the physicians are angry, the OBs are angry, the radiologists are angry, everyone's angry at her because you know, this can't possibly be true until she did another larger study, until a fellow from the National Cancer Institute named McMahon did another study and so on. And finally, 20 years later, they finally stopped doing x-rays to the abdomens of pregnant women, and now they do ultrasound, which is, you know, just as effective and certainly doesn't give off any radiation. There you have the first example. It wasn't a, you know, like being in Hiroshima or anything. It's just an x-ray, but that fetus is so sensitive, it's quite harmful. There have been other studies as well. For years, as you know, the United States military tested atomic bombs above the ground in Nevada and the South Pacific, the famous large mushroom clouds after the, the bomb exploded. Well, in those mushroom clouds, which were quite beautiful artistically, but quite horrifying in a health sense, were huge, tremendous amounts of radiation, over 100 radioactive chemicals. And they drifted across the atmosphere, generally from west to east where the, where the winds blow. And they came back down to earth from precipitation, from rain and snow, got into the, the food chain. They got into reservoirs for drinking water. They got into uh, pastures where milk-giving cows graze and where vegetables and fruits were grown, and humans ate them. For years, the U.S. government and all really around the world completely denied any chance that this fallout could have caused harm. All right, this went on for years. Even after the above-ground tests were banned by President Kennedy and Premier Khrushchev in 1963, it wasn't until 1999, until after the Cold War ended, and after all bomb tests were stopped, finally, finally, the uh, National Academy of Sciences issued a paper. They estimated that just thyroid cancer alone, the number of thyroid cancers alone that occurred in Americans because of Nevada bomb testing was up to 212,000. And that is probably an underestimate, and obviously wow. it goes far beyond, uh, far beyond thyroid cancer. 
and then they did that based on a study that the National Cancer Institute did on iodine exposures. So there, there was another one. Then, then the, the year after, the U.S. Energy Department did a study on um, workers at nuclear weapons plants, and they finally admitted that, you know what, here's a bunch of studies that show that workers are at higher risk for a number of cancers, which led to a program of, of compensation for, for the victims. So, you know, you, you see a pattern here. You start with an assumption. Hey, uh, low, low doses are fine. There's no studies needed. But as the studies were done again and again and again, we see that's simply not true which is what the scientific method is all about. You get a, a hypothesis and you test it using data. <laughs> and and you know, hopefully I, you have an objectivity about it. Yes, yes. But that assumption was clung to so strongly by the pro-nuclear forces that uh, I'll give you an example of what happened after Three Mile Island. In you know, 1979, Three Mile Island had a meltdown. Uh, you don't have to tell me. I was one mile away when it happened. Whether you realize this or not, uh, here's what happened afterwards. So more than half the core melted, there were releases, and, and so on. Now, as far as what the research community did to test health effects, it wasn't until nearly 12 years later, late 1990, when one peer-reviewed medical journal occurred showing actual numbers of cancers or deaths before and after Three Mile Island. There were none. But by that point... There were 31 studies that were done examining the psychological effects from Three Mile Island and whether or not these cause increases in, in, in cancer. Many of them were like in the Journal of Psychosomatic Medicine and, and, and things like that. It was a complete shutout. And when the first article came out in late 1990... Meaning the first one saying that, this, that it's all in your mind and you should just be calm about it? Well, it was, it was sort of like that. The, it was a group from Columbia University that published a study, American Journal of Public Health. They found that in the five years after Three Mile Island, in the 10-mile radius, the number of cancers went up 64% from the previous five years, all right? But they concluded that this was not due to any radiation from the accident, and they suggested that it was probably due to psychological trauma from the accident, all right? Oh. They, Later, that caused a fight. A group from U University of North Carolina, led by Dr. Stephen Wing, published this study using the same data, showing just the opposite conclusions that, yes, this, in fact, was linked. And there was a fight in, in the journals, back and forth and back and forth. It, it was really a terrible, really a disgraceful performance by the health research community. Most ignored it, allowing a number of people to write about psychological issues and then that terrible study by Columbia University. Um, that's the kind of thing that, that happens when you allow this assumption that relatively low doses are harmless to proliferate. No one was in a hurry to do any study. They were frightened of the... Um, I have talked to a number of experts, physicians, and scientists that know in their minds, I know Three Mile Island did something, but frightened to go and, and do studies because there would be ramifications to their grants and to their positions as members of hospitals and, and so on. Your writing partner, Dr. Janet Sherman, in an interview with her, she told me that the highest rates of thyroid cancer in the country, this is current, are in southeastern Pennsylvania and southwestern New Jersey, which is all downwind and downstream on the Susquehanna River from Three Mile Island. That's a study we did, um, our group did, uh, published in the International Journal of Health Services in the fall of 2009, and we take, a, take about a 90-mile radius, which is not very big, you know, uh, including eastern Pennsylvania, central New Jersey, southern New York, including the downwind area of Three Mile Island. Virtually every county has a much higher thyroid cancer rate than the nation. It, it also doesn't help that there are 16 total nuclear reactors there, 13 of which are still uh, operating the most reactor area of the country. But, yeah, it, it is the downwind area of three miles. And, of course, we know a lot of iodine was released, and we know iodine is linked to thyroid cancer. So returning to the IAEA list, all of this is fascinating, and I want to know more, but let's just complete this list. Yeah. Dr. Patel wrote that even if radiation, this is according to the IAEA, that even if radiation causes a lung cancer, it does not count if the person smokes in fact, whenever there is a possibility of another cause for cancer, radiation cannot be blamed. You know, that's so, so silly because cancers have multiple causes. I mean, just because 
I smoke for 50 years and, and die of lung cancer. It doesn't mean that there aren't other factors at work. I could be genetically predisposed. I could have been a coal miner and so on. Although it's very hard as a researcher to know exactly what percent of each factor caused the cancer. Was it 10% radiation? Was it 30% genes? Was it 20% smoking? Was it that sort of thing. Um, you don't really know, but you can take it to the bank that each of them caused it to help raise the risk. And you don't know where the tipping point came or which one of the factors are, but they all contributed. Uh, no question about it. You know, radiation does not lower your risk of cancer. You know, cigarette smoking does not lower your risk of cancer. Your genetic free does, does not lower. They all increase your risk. doesn't guarantee you'll get it, but it's raising the odds, that's for sure. And to suggest that there's only one cause, of, you know, if someone develops a cancer, there's only one cause to it, and that's that's absolutely wrong. There, there are multiple causes, especially in, in you know, modern society where we have multiple toxins that we're exposed to. Here's the last point that Dr. Bertel rose, and this one just blows my mind with the falseness of it. She wrote that if all else fails, according to the IAEA, it is possible to claim that radiation below some designated dose does not cause cancer, and then average over the whole body the radiation dose, which has actually been received by one part of the body or organ, as, for example, when radioiodine concentrates in the thyroid. This is another numerical trick used by authorities to try to downplay the harm of radiation. If you happen to live near Three Mile Island in March of 1979, and then you moved away to the and lived in the South Pole for the uh, for the rest of your life, you know where there are no people, there are no man, there is no man-made radiation, or very, very, very little. You know, as the years go on, the average hit to you is reduced. Doesn't mean you aren't at risk. You you were there at Three Mile Island. I mean, a lot of people, especially Jewish people near Chernobyl, moved and went to Israel, where they had been the su subject of, of studies. There were no Chernobyl-type accidents in Israel, but they were hit in just those few months that they stayed after Chernobyl and thus they are at high risk. So trying to average things out over a lifetime or over body parts is very, very misleading. No, it only takes one hit to really start the process in motion of damaging DNA and damaging cells and leading to mutations, leading to cancer or other disease. Given that the IAEA has totally gained this so that it is impossible for the World Health Organization to put out the truth, the scientific truth, and that they are putting out reports such as the one that came out earlier this year saying, you know, pay no attention to that radiation happening. It's not going to bother you and just keep calm and it's not going to hurt you. What is the danger in terms of the world's perspective on nuclear that is created by this report and the others the WHO has put out? Yeah, the, the danger would be that if we are to believe the IAEA, that we should expand nuclear power in this country and all over the world. We should build a bunch of new reactors because they're, they're safe. We should build larger ones. We should keep the existing ones and run them for longer and longer periods, even though they're getting old. We should do more x-rays and CAT scans of, of children and, and, and so on. This is really a dangerous thing here. And I think what it calls for is for independent scientists to step up, to not sit silently on the sidelines anymore, and to start conducting their own studies, all right? Is that the only way to counteract what the World Health Organization has been putting out? Well, you know, it, it's, it's really a combination of the scientists standing up and citizens taking this information and putting it forward. This is exactly what happened to lead up to the treaty in 1963 banning above ground atom bomb test. You know, there were studies done by scientists of the amount of fallout building up in, in baby teeth and other studies as well, and there were also large-scale protests by citizens, many of them women's groups, saying, you know, get the strontium-90 out of my baby's milk and, and so on. They would go in front of the White House and the UN and so on until finally the scientific and political pressure proved too much to the leaders, even, even though many wanted to continue testing. The treaty was signed by the U.S., the Soviets, and, and Britain. That's the only way it can work, because if you, if you leave this concentration of power to one group that is obviously biased, that obviously has a, an interest in seeing the proliferation of this kind of technology, your society is going to be at greater risk. It's sort of like the tobacco companies for, for years. 
you know, denying any any consequence, any risk that cigarette smoking and tobacco use would would harm people. For a long time, the, um, the, the medical community was was rather silent. But finally, finally, in the 1960s, the big Surgeon General report and, and many reports after that finally established that it was it was in fact very harmful. They, they fought, they still fought it after that, and they still don't agree. But obviously, the power of the government and the power of, of scientists caused many people to in fact quit smoking. So we're really looking at a preventive health issue here. We want to lower the uh, exposures of people to, to this, this type of radioactivity. And we've done studies showing that when this happens, such as when the bomb test ended and when nuclear plants closed, there are instant sharp declines in infant deaths, in child cancers, and over a long term in, in total cancers. This is no different than any physician treating a cancer and, and keeping a person alive. This is, this is a, a better way to do it. It's real prevention so that people can live their lives without having to, to deal with the ravages of this horrible disease and, and other diseases. So I think that's what it really calls for scientists and citizens to take that power back from the IAEA. Joe, if the very motivated listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat were to take action to support you, to support a changing of this policy, what, if anything, would you suggest that we do? Of course, I'm going to mention our group, the Radiation Public Health Project. Our website is www.radiation.org. We have been a group for almost a quarter century, since 1989, and we have produced 31 medical journal articles. We have written eight books. We have written over 50 op-eds and given 26 press conferences and received national coverage. We are the only organization in the U.S. with a focus on conducting studies and educating people about the hazards of nuclear reactors. We need to be supported. The government is not interested in supporting us and certainly industry is not interested in supporting us. They're interested in, in, in discrediting us, even though we deal in facts. We deal in, in actual re research. So I would highly urge people to visit the website and either to volunteer to help as a concerned citizen with their time and or to donate funds to help our group as well because no one is doing these kinds of studies. Nobody. Nobody. I don't know of any other type of toxin type of pollutant that has this kind of a group as well. At least we give the anti-nuclear movement in this country information on actual health hazards. Joe, first of all, I can't begin to thank you enough for the work that you have been doing for these 25 years and probably before that as well, and also for this extremely informative, far more than I, I thought I was going to get, and I relish every moment of this interview that you have granted to Nuclear Hot Seat and through the podcast, literally to listeners around the world, where hopefully we can figure out a way to take action. Maybe we can find some whistleblowers inside the WHO or the IAEA. That would be fun. Do you have any of those, by the way, in your hip pocket? No. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. They helped a lot here at uh, San Onofre. But in yeah. any event, Joe, thank you. You have made a difference in the world, and I know you will continue to make a difference by giving us the science to back up the contentions that we have and fight yeah. to free the World Health Organization so it can stand for the truth about nuclear instead of just being a propaganda arm of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Well, thanks, and I want to thank you for helping get the word out because that's that's the real critical thing. We have a lot of information. The thing is to get it into people's hands and to encourage them to take action. That's exactly what this podcast is all about. Thanks, Jeff. Very good, Lemmy. That was Joseph Mangano of Radiation and Public Health Project. The website is www.radiation.org. A reminder that my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond is available in ebook format on Amazon.com. You can search under my name. You can search under the title Yes I Glow in the Dark. Please take a moment, take a look at it, and if you wish to purchase, know that you'll be getting a story, a rip rousing story, of what it means to be one mile away from a leaking nuclear reactor when it happens. And you'll also be helping to support me and the work that I do on Nuclear Hot Seat. So take a look, 
There's a sample chapter there. You can also get a sample chapter from our website, nuclearhotseat.com. Just put in your information, and you will get it back by return email in PDF form. Activist shout-out. Thanks for those of you who helped keep Nuclear Hot Seat going while I took my unplugged retreat to the mountains. Specifically, specifically, Gail Payne and Sean Arclight. Gratitude for your help in posting about last week's episode. Also, Mike Fluke, who continues to help me with my website, and also runs the site radiationprevention.com. It's got a lot of information on it and also a forum for the discussion of radiation issues, which is meant to be an in-gathering for everyone in this community, no matter where you stand on radiation issues, so that you can discuss, ask questions, give opinions, hold debates. Let's get the conversation going and let's keep it going, because only in this way will we come up with clarity and the closest thing to unanimity that we can create. John Stewart! Okay, Bobby, this is for real. Now I'm going to write you up a routine and send it care of the producer who is available to a member of our community who has reached out and let me know this. Woohoo! Getting closer all the time, John Bobby. You will have your nuclear pundit yet. Here's today's final thought. I cannot tell you how amazing it was to get away from all things nuclear for seven whole days. I camped on an unimproved site in the California Redwoods. I had a fire ring and a picnic table, and that was it. No Wi-Fi, not even a cell phone connection. As a matter of fact, the only electronic device I touched all week was my smartphone, and that was only to take endless pictures and video of my new puppy, and yes, they will be posted. I sat for long periods of time alone in nature, marveling at how perfect it all is, and reflecting on how much mankind has done to destroy such miracles as this land. I know that much happened in the nuclear-focused world while I was gone. If I missed it from any of my regular sources, your email and Facebook messages got word across to me loud and clear. It is going to take a while for me to catch up. And, of course, there will be more coming in day after day every day. It never ends, does it? Part of me, quite honestly, still wishes I were up there in the mountains, staring at the analog world of nature and ignorant of all things nuclear. Then I come back here and see the interviews I've got lined up and will get to do, the people I'll talk to, the stories I will get to share, the outrage, the anger, and the humor inspired by all forms of nuclear numbnutsery and the proud, fierce, angry heart of this wonderful community that we share in. Part of what makes taking time off so valuable is that it recharges my battery to do more of this work. I am still moving slowly, retaining as much of that vacation bliss as I can for as long as I can. But I'm also getting through my real work as well. Whole new program next week, and the week after that marks the start of year four of Nuclear Hot Seat. Time to double down and focus more intensely on what will make this show even better. Good thing I got to rest and recuperate. It's going to be a long, hot nuclear summer. Thanks for being part of it with me. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 3rd, 2014. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. We are now on three times a week, including a flashback random replay on Tuesdays. We are also heard on AirAmerica.com. Our archive is available on iTunes, subscribe under podcasts, or you can check our website because we're searchable. Yay! Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We're copyright 2014, Lee B. Halevi, and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed in nonprofit circumstances. You have my permission to reuse as long as proper attribution, website, and email are included. If you're for profit and want to use any of this, call me. We'll talk. I'm reasonable. At least just you're not pro-nuclear. This is Lee B. Halevi of Hardestry Communications the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Sister Megan Rice is still in prison for embarrassing the U.S. government by exposing its lack of security at the Oak Ridge Y-12 site in Tennessee when all she thought she was doing was staging a peaceful protest against nuclear weapons. 
best we not forget. So we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. <laughs>